there's one great thing that happens in Acts 6. And it's, it's something that's full of lessons. Uh, there's not only hypocrisy within the church at Jerusalem, in the cases of Ananias and Sapphira, but there's dissent, there's disagreement. Now, remember what we read. Turn back to Acts 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. They didn't view anything as their property. They shared everything with everybody else, and no one ever made any claims. Now, let me just say this. It didn't last. It didn't last. And Scripture is honest to admit that it didn't last. And by the time you get to Acts 6, there was a fight going on among the women, and it developed along racial lines. There were Jews which, who lived in Jerusalem, who never left Jerusalem or who never left Israel. They stayed near home. They didn't move away. They were called Palestinian Jews. Not every Jew stayed in Israel. These Jews would go out to different part of, parts of the Roman Empire. They were traders. They were merchants. They were very gifted in commercial activity, as Jews still are today. If they found a way to make more money far from Israel, then they would go far from Israel. But if they were observant Jews, they would come back to Israel on the feast days, like the Feast of Passover. It's evident that many of the Jews who were part of the church at Jerusalem were converted on the Feast of Pentecost uh, when God poured the Holy Spirit out and all these mighty miracles were being worked. And so they stayed and they became a part of, of the church at Jerusalem. Well, the church in Jerusalem was sharing food. Well, we, we have a tendency to want to be with people who are like us. We have a saying in English. I don't know if you have it in Russian. Birds of a feather flock together. In other words, if somebody's like you, that's the person that you're going to be with. Maybe it's the same race. Maybe it's the same language. Maybe it's the same church. Maybe it's the same faculty at the university. That's the, that's the, those are the people you're, you're going to want to, to hang with and, and, and to talk to. And so in the church in Jerusalem, the Jewish widows who were being supported by the church, who were from Palestine, right there around Jerusalem, they kept in their group. And the Jewish widows who were what they call what we call the Hellenistic Jews, they were outside of Palestine. They had been impacted by Greek culture. They spent time together. Well, pretty soon, the Hellenistic uh, widows said, you know what? The Palestinian widows are getting more food than we are. And there was a quarrel. And so there was a problem from the inside. So the apostles asked themselves the question, are we going to spend our time trying to figure out who should get this much food or that much food? Is that what we're supposed to do? And the answer is no, that's not what we're supposed to do. So they appointed seven men and they gave them that job. Now, the normal conclusion is that these seven men were the first deacons, but the word deacon is not in the text. I think they were deacons, but the word deacon is not mentioned in Acts 6. They gave the congregation the um, responsibility to select seven men of good reputation. This is Acts 6, verse 3, full of the spirit and of, and of wisdom who could be in charge of this job. Normally in a church, the deacons are in charge of the physical and financial resources of the church. And there, they meet together to try to figure out how can we share this wealth? How can we invest these resources? What's the right way to do it? What's the fair way to do it? 
that's what the deacons normally do in a church, and that's what the deacons did in this church. And this was the way that the apostles met the challenge. They gave somebody authority, and they gave somebody responsibility. And hopefully, we think, the problem was solved. One of those men who will become very, very famous in the next chapter was called Stephen. Requirements, the qualifications for deacons are found in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The um, requirements for elders are found also in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and also in Titus chapter 1. Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3 talks about what an elder does. 1 Peter 5 talks about what a, uh, an elder is. Acts 6 in 1 Timothy 3 talks about what a deacon does. The word deacon means servant. This is one challenge that we have when we, when we try to understand exactly how the first century church worked. So many of the words which we use formally for church offices are also normal everyday words. The word elder was a normal everyday word. The word deacon was a normal everyday word. And because the word deacon means servant, we see in chapter 6 verse 1 that um, there's a reference to the daily serving of food. We see in verse 2 that the apostles are asking themselves, are we supposed to neglect the Word of God so that we can serve tables? So this, these are actually forms of the word deacon which are being considered here, and so it's probably right to conclude that this was the way that deacons were established. These seven are named in uh, verse 5, Stephen and Philip and um, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas. And uh, then we're told at the end of the passage that at this particular time in the history of the church, a number of priests were coming to the faith. You see, when we, when we talk about how wicked the priests were and how wicked the Pharisees were, that doesn't mean that no Pharisees were saved. Uh, we, know that, we know that Nicodemus was a Pharisee and he was saved. We know that Saul of Tarsus was a Pharisee and he was saved. And we know from the last verse of chapter 6 that many of the priests themselves were being saved. When we get to verse 8 of chapter 6, we see the focus of Holy Scripture rest more prominently on one of the deacons, the most famous of the deacons. The, one of the first deacons became one of the first martyrs. When we were studying Acts 1, we made note of the fact that this important verse, Acts 1.8, which says, you shall be my witnesses, we noted at that time that the Greek word for witness is martus. The plural is martyres. We get the English word martyr from that word. Now, the original Greek word has nothing to do with dying, but this original deacon and this original witness he did die, and we call him the first martyr to the faith after the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in verse 8 that Stephen was full of grace and power, and he was performing great wonders. Now, here's the thing we have to remember. We usually think of the miracle-working ministry as being restricted to the apostles, but it wasn't. Stephen was also performing great wonders. And he wasn't an apostle. In the church, we normally think of the deacons as those who serve and the elders as those who preach and teach. But we mustn't make these distinctions airtight. Elders ought also to serve. Because Jesus himself said, I am among you as one who serves. Let him who would be great among you, the one who would be greatest among you, let him become servant of all. But also, the longest sermon 
and perhaps the most powerful sermon preached in the book of Acts is not preached by Peter, and it's not preached by Paul. It's preached by Stephen, this man who we believe was one of the first deacons. Now, Stephen was having such a dynamic ministry that the enemies of the gospel resolved to stop him. And um, they told lies about him. They said that he was speaking blasphemy, blasphemy against uh, Moses and against God. And so they put forward false witnesses. Acts 6, verse 13. Notice what it says. This man speaks against this holy place, that is the temple and the law. Remember, Jesus says that a greater than the temple was here, meaning himself, meaning Christ. It was impossible for the Sadducees and the priests to think that Christ could be greater than the temple. And um, they felt they had God trapped. They felt they had God localized. If, if they control the temple, they control God because God had to work through the temple. God had inaugurated the temple. He had designated the temple to be the place where he met with men with men. And therefore, if they control the temple, they control the way that God met with men, the way God revealed himself to the men. So now here these apostles are saying, no, God reveals himself to us finally through his son. That's what it says in Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. And you see the threat that that is to them. They can't control Christ. If they can't control Christ, they can't control God. They can't control the temple. So they can't control the people. So they've got to say, no, 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 it's not Christ. It's the temple. It's this place which we control. And they accuse Stephen of blasphemy just by saying he spoke against the temple and he spoke against the law, which he did not. Now, by the end of verse, uh, chapter 6, they're looking at him and they're waiting on him to respond. Verse 15 is a very unusual verse in the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, it's a very unusual um, verse in the whole Bible. It says that when, when Stephen was being accused and when he, when he was preparing to make his response, they looked at his face and his face was like the face of an angel. Now that's very extraordinary. I don't know exactly what that means. By the way, the word angel, malach in Hebrew, angelos in Greek, means messenger. Stephen is about to preach a great sermon. Stephen is about to deliver God's message. It will be the last words he ever utters. He will pay for his faithfulness with his life. When I think of the face of an angel, I think of some of a face burning with intelligence. I think of a face that's beautiful. You know, not all beautiful faces look intelligent. And not all intelligent faces look beautiful. But I think of beauty and intelligence when I think of an angel. And I think of a face that's shining when I think of an angel. Probably Stephen's face reflected all those qualities. TVS is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion 
and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efca.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota. 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com